Thank you very much. I'm very I'm so very happy to be here today and partnering again with the DPC for another webinar on what we wish we knew about digital preservation. So the inspiration just to give you a bit of context about International Archives Week. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Anthea Sellis, the Secretary General of the International Council on Archives. Um, so International Archives Week really began in about 2000, well, International Archives Day, which is today, so happy International Archives Day, started in 2009, uh, or even before that, actually, and we started International Archives Week in 2009 because essentially Inter Ar International Archives Day just wasn't enough. So every year we've been growing International Archives Week, and past few years we've been doing our social media campaign. This year's theme is empowering archives. Um, and the inspiration for that was really one partly ICA's new strategic plan, empowering archives in the profession, but also we wanted to give people an opportunity to have some more in-depth, perhaps interesting conversations about what archives are, particularly in the 21st, archives and records are in the 21st century. And we've axed it on three pillars. So the three pillars are accountability and transparency, collaboration and networking, and diversity and inclusivity. And so our webinar series, including this one here with DPC, is along one of those three streams. The one here for DPC is around collaboration and networking. And we did the, a similar webinar last year about what we wish we knew about digital preservation. And it was extremely popular. So we are reprising this now. Um, and we are joined by colleagues from all over the world to talk a bit about what they wish they knew about digital preservation. And in particular, what they would like to share about collaboration and networking. And so we've brought experts from across the DPC and the ICA to share their thoughts uh, with with you over the course of the next hour and a half. Now, I don't want to take too, too much time, but I'm going to go through just a few more housekeeping things. Um, so the presentation, this will be recorded. So for everybody's, for the sake of transparency. Recording and, in progress. And there we go, time perfectly. <laughs> it, we are going to be sharing this recording on the ICA and the Digital Preservation Coalition social media channels. Uh, us will be sharing it on Facebook Live and on our YouTube channel. And I believe DPC will be sharing this as well on their YouTube channel. We're currently streaming live on Facebook Live and on the Digital Preservation Coalition's YouTube channel. So say hi to everybody who's joining us, uh, perhaps remotely and wasn't able to sign up for this webinar. Very pleased to have you all here today. Um, and please feel free to ask questions for those of you that are on the live feeds. Uh, we have people monitoring those feeds and the questions can be in English, French and Spanish because we'll be monitoring in those three languages and we'll be trying to facilitate and give some a little bit of interpretation as much as we can uh, during the course of the webinar so we can be a little bit more inclusive and diverse uh, in terms of the experts that we can in participants that we can hear from. Um, I would ask that all participants make sure that their microphones are muted and that your videos are off unless you are actively speaking so please if you could shut your microphones and videos off. Um, we will be doing some pre-submitted uh, questions first. So those will be the questions that, for those of you that have signed up from the webinar, you would have been asked to provide some questions for our participants to, or our speakers to have a look at and prepare some answers to. For the first four questions, which uh, that will be asked by William, those questions we have made translations for. And so we'll be popping that into the chat box. Um, we still encourage people to use the chat box to our participants here to ask any other questions. And if we have time, we'll try and get to those questions. If not, we will compile all those questions and we will work with the Digital Preservation Coalition and with participant, the speakers on this call to answer all those questions and uh, on uh, via a blog. So just a reminder, please, if you could remember to mute your, your microphones, that would be great. Um, and then somebody will be monitoring, like I said, both the Facebook and the YouTube feeds for anybody who's following us live. And again, those will be fed through the chat box and we'll do our best to get to those. Uh, if not during the call, then we'll do it afterwards. So I'm gonna stop talking now and hand over to the eminent William Kilbride. Well, thank you very much, uh, Anthea, uh, for your introduction and for the partnership, which this represents the, the theme, one of the themes of International Archives Week, as you've mentioned already, is 
is collaboration. And I should start by offering a kind of a, a welcome to the collaboration which has brought this around today. You know, the collaboration, long-standing collaboration between the International Council on Archives uh, and ourselves at the Digital Preservation uh, Coalition. So my job in the first 20 minutes or so uh, of our presentation of our webinar today is just to set the theme, okay? So my job is to say a word or two of introduction about the issues of digital preservation. But the good news is you'll then be able to test all the things I say against a panel of experts brought together uh, who will also have things to add and nuance and, and clever observations about their own experience in digital preservation and their experience in particular around the topic of collaboration. So uh, I shall get myself underway. I shall begin, uh, bear with me while I share my screen and then proceed also not just to share my screen, but to move into presenter mode on the screen. And I'm going to assume you're all looking at the right thing, which is uh, uh, my screen, uh, possibly with a little box in it, which is actually I can minimize a little because that's just the presenters, or my own view of myself, which is a bit intimidating. Anyway. Off we go. So my uh, job in this session is just to briefly introduce issues around digital preservation uh, and to make it uh, just to set the scene for what we want to do. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that in four steps. I'm going to observe that data has a big future ahead of it, almost, if we can get this right. I'm going to give a very brief, very brief introduction to the main themes and topics of digital preservation. And then I'm going to go in two directions. I want to talk about some myths around digital preservation, things that we have worried about, but maybe don't need to worry about so much. And then I'm going to make an observation about three practical experiences, which come from my experience in digital preservation, but also my view into the digital preservation community. So that's my purpose uh, today. And I'll, I'll let Sarah and Anthea and colleagues pick up on the chat or interrupt me if there's any uh, significant matters to, uh, to attend to. So let's get going. Data, at least in theory, has a, a big future. And we hear a great deal about the data-led economy and, and exciting high-level statements, for example, that data is the new oil driving innovation and establishing new ways uh, of working. Uh, and yet, uh, our practical experience of digital preservation, our practical experience of this new economy is actually rather more uh, to do with data loss. So every week, here's a, a topical example, Victoria University of Wellington accidentally nukes files on all desktop PCs. Uh, and a message to students at the university, and you think, goodness gracious, imagine being a student in receipt of a message like that, how must that feel? And of course, I hope you'll understand here that I'm not uh, meaning to criticise. Uh, I don't mean to be unkind uh, because my experience, digital preservation, it can make bleak reading. It can make bleak reading in all sorts of different contexts for all sorts of different reasons. So, you know, we can... <laughs> Maybe later at the, uh, towards the end of the seminar, we can have a, a sort of two minute silence for data loss, for those things that we all have had and inadvertently uh, misplaced or rendered obsolete or uh, lost the password for, uh, or whatever that may be. What's the problem? Well, why does that, why are we so used to that issue of data loss? And we're used to it because of any number of big reasons and there's, not, I don't particularly want to dwell on these individual items. I just really want to make three observations uh, about this list. First of all, the list is incomplete. There's more going on here than I'm simply listed on the screen. Secondly, uh, to observe that it's a long list, you know, so to find a solution to any element here, it's going to, you know, you're going to need to put quite a few different elements together. So it's a complicated problem to begin with. And thirdly, to observe that many of these items are themselves dynamic. And consequently, digital preservation has a characteristic of being an emergent and complex problem. 
That's to say you solve it and then you need to come back and solve it again. So there's a complex set of issues underneath this digital preservation question. What do I mean by digital preservation? Let me make a simple definition at the start so we're all on the same page. And I'm going to use the definition from the Digital Preservation Handbook, which is one of the resources the DPC makes available, that, that digital preservation is the series of managed activities necessary to ensure continued access to digital materials for as long as necessary. Let me pull out those words in bold because they're important. It's a series of actions. That's to say it's not an event, it's an ongoing process. These are managed activities. So they sit within a management and policy framework for your organisation or the decisions that you make. What we're about here isn't about the bits and bytes. Explicitly what we're concerned with is access. And explicitly what we're concerned with then is something in the real world. We don't start with the bits and bytes. We need to intervene with the bits and bytes, but really it's real world impacts that we're seeking. And finally, we're not necessarily looking to look after everything and we're not having to look after everything forever. We're looking for those materials that need to be managed and only to manage them for as long as necessary. And in some cases that will be a long time. Some of you will have a mandate for, for perpetuity. Others might have a very short mandate, maybe for five or 10 or 20 years, but even in the context of emerging changes of technology, that's an awfully long time. And so agencies which historically wouldn't think of themselves as archives, or memory institutions oftentimes have a digital preservation challenge. So let's uh, move on to a very quick introduction to the main themes of digital preservation. Let me make uh, three uh, notes here. Firstly, for the avoidance of doubt, that digitization and digital preservation uh, are the related but are not the same. And you may, I know you know this, okay? I know you know this, and apologies for uh, repeating what you already know. But you may need to repeat this over. You may need to repeat this frequently. So let's to just pull it out here. Digitization being the process uh, of creating digital materials from uh, what might be an analog original. It could be a photograph, it could be scanning, it could be 3D laser scanning, it could be any it could be keying, it could be any number of ways where you create a digital version uh, of uh, an analog original. And by digital preservation, as already said, it's the managed activities necessary to ensure continued access uh, to those materials. And of course, these are related. So digitization creates a digital preservation need, but digital preservation also relates to what you would call born digital materials. So these are connected, but they're not the same. How to proceed with digital preservation? I'm a, a great fan of this very simple model put together by Nancy McGovern and Anne Kenny. This must be 20 years or more now uh, since they described digital preservation as a three-legged stool. That's to say it needs more than just technology. Technology, organisation and resources. Uh, to phrase that differently for me, digital preservation turns out to be a socio-technical question. And if all we bring to the table is technology, then we'll fail to answer a significant part of the question. So how do we build a socio-technical solution to this problem? We're going to need technology resources uh, as well as organization to achieve that. And there are, I suppose, four classic approaches to how you would then go about implementing a digital preservation strategy. And again, you will be potentially familiar with these, but let me make a, a, a couple of observations. So migration is the classic approach to digital preservation. And the classic approach concerns itself with the informational content. And you look at the information content and you want that information content to be available through subsequent generations of computing or uh, technology or software doesn't matter what software, you just want the information content. So you're going to intervene at the information layer. And that typically means file formats. So how a file is presented to you as a structure, 
you intervene there, you migrate through different versions of the file format to maintain the information content. A second approach, uh, emulation. Uh, emulation would involve intervening at a much deeper layer within your technology environment, intervening in the operating system and all the dependencies that make the machine work to operate software. You know, and, and so you would then be able to run, for example, run old instances of software. So migration and emulation, I suppose, are made the running in digital preservation over the years. And to be clear, migration has made most of the running. And it's made most of the running, I think, because almost any desktop computer will have a save as function. So it's really an export and save as function. And you're keeping the information content because you've exported it to another format. And it's relatively easy to get started on that road. Emulation has proven harder, I think, in the early years to make come good on. But there are, and also because somehow the use case of emulation has been less well understood. But if what you're interested in is reproducibility, reproducible science, for example, or checking how a process arrives at an outcome, whatever that might be, emulation is going to be your way of achieving that. Now, emulation has also required much more technical knowledge. Uh, and so it's only really with the advent of cloud computing that we really see emulation as a viable prospect because the ability to assemble uh, through virtual machines, all of those different pieces or applications of software to make a, 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 an effective emulation, it's only really now becoming possible. And my guess is that migration has made the running up till now but actually in the advent of cloud computing, emulation will, will be uh, the next great thing, as it were, the thing to watch in digital preservation. Let me make two other observations around how people have approached digital preservation, really for completeness. So there is also an approach which says we need to look after the hardware, maintain access to old computing equipment. Again, all of us, I think, have a cupboard somewhere uh, uh, or, a, or a box with old wires and old computing equipment. Let me observe there are cases where that is what you need to do, but those cases are rare and they're also quite expensive because manufacturing peripherals is going to be costly. Finding, that's to say, uh, replacement parts is going to be hard for uh, maintaining hardware in a functioning state. There are cases where you need to but it's going to be a, a marginal case in, in my view. And finally, to observe that this is an emerging question. So you might think to yourself, I've got a solution. And it could be that someone in the room today, it could be that one of you out there actually has a completely different approach that we need to listen to. And, and so the organizations which recognize that this is a research question and engage with that research are likely to make good progress also. That also helps understand how the preservation landscape is configured, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. So let's now turn our attention to a couple of myths, as I phrased them, around digital preservation. First myth about long-lived media, and the second, which is the danger about perfection. So let me observe, working as I do for the Digital Preservation Coalition, once a week I get an email from someone telling me they've invented some perfect media that will last forever. And it seems to me that long-lived media is a red herring and it's not going to be the long-term solution. We need storage, don't get me wrong, we need good, reliable, robust, replicated storage, but simply tying everything into some particular type of device creates a dependency and that dependency will do for us in the long run. So long-lived media uh, is, in my view, uh, a red herring for digital preservation. The second danger here or myth is that we need to wait for perfection. It's a research topic, we'll wait till someone's fixed it, then we'll apply it. And I can understand why that feels attractive. You know, 10 or 15 years ago, there were very few solutions and it was a daunting challenge. And after, two decades of research, we've turned a daunting challenge into a daunting challenge with, with its own jargon now. And that's because digital preservation has been configured as a research project and 
sometimes we're not being very good, I think, at integrating with other systems. And I mean that in the very broadest sense, systems of organizational structure and function, as much as to do with other computing systems. How hard can it be to preserve digital materials? And you might recognize some of you the OAIS reference model and to observe that it can get very difficult very quickly and it begins to look a bit like an engineering plan uh, for the future. What I would want to emphasize, what I really would want to emphasize is not to wait for perfection, to get going in digital preservation. There are reasons why our standards look as difficult sometimes to make sense of as they do. Uh, but actually, if the advice you need is to make sure the backup is not on the floor of the server room, then start there. You know, there are simple steps everyone can take and not to be too distracted by all the high end stuff. If you know that there are simple steps to take better to get started than to wait for perfection. Let me make some observations then as I come to the end about real experiences of digital preservation. Firstly, to observe that money uh, turns out to be a significant challenge facing digital preservation. So David Rosenthal gives us these statistics that our ability to create data is outstripping our ability to store data, which is massively outstripping our ability uh, to manage uh, that data. Another example recently from my own work, uh, looking at the non-print legal deposit collections at the British Library, they have expanded 38-fold, 38-fold expansion in five years. Suffice to say the budget has not expanded <laughs> at the same level. So we've got a real challenge on our hands to keep up with all of this data growth. And of course that leads us to recognising that keeping digital materials also invites us to dispose uh, of digital materials. Perhaps that's something we can pick up in discussion. So is digital preservation expensive? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in too many cases, it's an unfunded mandate. It's just something else the archive has been asked to do. And that's why the policy and advocacy pieces around digital preservation really, really matter. Secondly, a question in the digital preservation world, how can you be good enough at digital preservation? How can you make progress uh, through this domain? And I want you to imagine your digital preservation journey. I want you to imagine going from a beginner to an expert as your maturity improves. And of course, there's going to be some effort uh, involved in that. So there's an expense of effort involved in moving from early days through to that expertise. And you would hope, you would think that that curve would look something like this, you know, that you begin and you learn and you've got a lot of effort to do the learning, but as you get better at it, so it gets easier and your expertise and the effort drops as the uh, amount of expertise available to you becomes uh, good. So that you would think that this is the journey into digital preservation. But I've, I've got news for you, and maybe this is good news or bad news, and maybe I'm being a little facetious, but the reality of digital preservation for a lot of organisations is a bit more like this, that the move towards expertise is a complicated journey with backwards and forward steps uh, as we go. What I'm saying is we need to theorise the change. How do we theorise the change? Well, we set reasonable goals, and that's where the maturity modeling tools like the DPC's rapid assessment model or the NDSA levels of digital preservation, they become incredibly useful because you can establish reasonable goals and decide where you need to uh, head next. And now, good news. And uh, <laughs> now, good news about digital preservation. The good news. This is a shared challenge. It's the reason why we speak about this on Collaboration Day at International Archives Week. It's a shared challenge. And if you're doing digital preservation alone, chances are you're not doing it right. So there's a great opportunity for us to share our knowledge and expertise in digital preservation. And that leads me into really uh, wrapping up my short presentation 
and inviting uh, our panelists and start inviting some of the discussion around how we manage and achieve that collaboration uh, within digital preservation. So that was my uh, intention by way of setting uh, us all up today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, and I'm going to now start inviting our panelists to uh, join us. And my first panelist is uh, Jay Weatherburn. So uh, Jay is a member of staff at the University of Melbourne and leads the DPC's office in uh, Australasia. Uh, and of course, time zones are somewhat against uh, Jay's participation uh, in our uh, webinar today. So I'm pleased to report that Jay has sent us a, a presentation uh, as a movie, and she's going to talk to us uh, in this about the network she manages in Australia called Oz Preserves. Over to Jay. I'm very happy to see all those faces and people meeting together face to face. Wouldn't that be, won't that be wonderful uh, when we're able to meet face to face uh, uh, again? So I know Jay won't be able to, she's not on the call today, but I'm pretty sure that if you have questions or want to participate in uh, Australasia Preserves, then I'm sure Jay would be delighted to hear from you. So we will do our best to capture those uh, questions uh, or contacts and pass them on to uh, uh, Jay. So our second uh, uh, panellist today, it's a very great pleasure to hand over to uh, Marcel Rass. Marcel joining us from The Hague uh, today. And Marcel has been a long-term friend and ally of the, the DPC in his previous role uh, with, well, what was then NCDD and subsequently the Dutch Digital Heritage network and Marcel also know recently has changed and I'll let Marcel introduce that properly and finding that collaboration matters at a national scale and a local scale too. Marcel. Yeah thank you William and uh, hello everyone uh, great to see so many people in this uh, in this webinar uh, today so thank you very much for inviting me to share some experience on collaboration in the dig on digital preservation in the Netherlands. Um, as William already mentioned, um, my name is Marcel Ras, and since April 1st, I am the manager of the Research Data Support Network of the VU University in Amsterdam. So it's not the, um, the Amsterdam University, but the VU University in Amsterdam. Uh, in, and in this capacity, I'm responsible for coordination of the research data support activities within the university. And I hope you don't mind when I suggest a slight change of the title of the panel. Um, the theme of uh, the International Archives Week is empowering archives and collaboration. And I would suggest to change this to empowering archive through collaboration. Um, as I believe collaboration makes institutes stronger and not only archives. And I would uh, like to argue that we need collaboration beyond the walls of inst institutional domains. So empowering archives would become empowering uh, the cultural heritage uh, uh, domain. I introduced myself working at the VU University in the research data domain, but until recently I was the program manager for the activities related to digital preservation 
at the Dutch Digital Heritage Network. This network is a collaborative effort of many uh, Dutch cultural heritage institutes, having the aim of guaranteeing the long-term accessibility and the development of facilities which improve findability and usability of digital collections. And I want to tell you a bit more on the collaborative nature of digital preservation and the digital preservation community in the Netherlands. As there is a long tradition in collaboration in digital preservation within the Netherlands. This goes back to the beginning of the 21st century. It's, and it started as a practical necessity for sharing knowledge by some large scale institutes, building facilities for preserving the digital collections, like the National Library, uh, the National Archives and the Dutch Institute for Sound and Vision. And the question was, how do, how do we approach this new challenge? And how do we approach this new ch challenge collaboratively? And I have to stress that this type of collaboration was based on experts, on people finding each other in this challenge. And this is the thread through collaboration. Experts being people sharing knowledge and sharing experience. The next step in collaboration in the Netherlands was the establishment of the Dutch Digital Preservation Coalition, the NCDD, in, in 2008. Within the NCDD, institutes with similar digital preservation challenges found each other in a new organization. And for, uh, for this, we very much looked at the Digital Preservation Coalition in the UK. We even did a survey on the current state of digital preservation, very similar as the Mind the Gap survey in the UK. Uh, so the inst institutes joined forces and focused on four main questions. Uh, the first question was, how can we share infrastructure? if at all, uh, and how can we determine the costs of digital preservation? How can we find division of labor in collecting specific digital co co collections? Should all institutes collect websites or should we just focus on one institute collecting uh, websites? And the last question was, how can we share knowledge and ex expertise and build a curriculum for digital preservationists? The NCDD had a very small budget, uh, uh, some governmental funding uh, used to host an, op uh, an office and organize expert meetings on the topics mentioned. So the early days were very much about raising awareness, sharing knowledge and exchanging ex expertise. What started as a very small group of experts grew in a couple of years to a much longer, larger group of experts. I remember our first meetings uh, they were uh, on topics like web archiving, audit and certification, OES, uh, costs and cost models, web archiving, and so on. And at these meetings, there were about 15 experts present. And, uh, and these were all, on all occasions, the same people. 15 became 30, 30 became 50, and in 2016, there were over 100 participants at our first national web archiving conference. So that means that uh, uh, the, the community of digital preservation is grew and grew very rapidly. For the NCD, NCDD, that meant that we have to take new step. So we started to set up small projects related to the questions I mentioned before. These projects were financed by the main participants in the NCDD, and we could call them the coalition of the willing. So we didn't have any gov uh, uh, governance funding. It was, were the institutes uh, uh, collaborating in the NCDD, which funded the projects. Uh, and we had two uh, objectives with these projects. First was to develop preservation tools and services. And second, which is also very important, to get to know each other and to get to know each other's ch challenges. Um, and this second aspect of, of the project, uh, which is again very important, as collaboration is working together with experts, again being people, and to be able to work together, uh, uh, one had to trust each other. We often say that digital preservation is all about trust and guarantee long term access. Collaboration is also about trust. Then in 2018, the NCDD became part of a, of a broader network a new network, the Dutch Digital Heritage Network. Uh, more, more funding became available and there was uh, another plus in this step. From the early age of collaboration, digital preservation was the issue. Digital preservation was the single issue. 
So we found each other on the challenges on uh, how to safely preserve digital assets. assets. Within the Dutch Digital Heritage Network, the network became broader as the, dig the Dutch Digital Heritage Network also had programs on the visibility and usability of digital heritage. In other words, who are the users of digital collections and what do they need? How can we connect collections to serve users better? With this broader perspective, we could present preservation as, an, as the important precondition for the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and use, reusability of, dig, of digital collections. And um, you see FAIR, uh, the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and re reusability uh, in this, which makes the connection with my current job and domain, the research data domain. Also in this area, long-term care, care of digital access, assets is an important condition for the future of research and researchers. It is one of the most important aspects of the developments toward open science and open availability of research uh, outcome. And working according to the FAIR principles is an important vehicle to boost the impact of science. Without careful hand handling of cur and curation of data, it will become impossible to share data and research outcomes or to validate research outcomes following the European developments towards the European Open Science Cloud and the Netherlands developed a national plan for open science. Without going into the details of the plan, I would like to stress that many of the proposed activities in this plan are about collaboration, collaboration in research data management and research, research data support. So collaboration within and across the boundaries of universities and uh, across the boundaries of the country. They are of, of great importance to bring the adoption of open science and the FAIR principles further. Now back to collaboration in the cultural heritage domain. Governmental funding for the Dutch Digital Heritage Network enabled the digital preservation program to go beyond knowledge exchange and meeting up with colleagues. It enables us to develop instruments that help institutes with their pre uh, preservation efforts. And just I, I would just like to mention a couple of these instruments. So we developed a digital learning environment, a course helping institutes in teaching their staff. We developed a preservation policy development uh, tool, which helps in building an institutional uh, uh, policy and avoids for them having invent the wheel over and over again in policy making. Yeah. A guidance on audit and certification based on the core trust uh, and on the core trust seal principles providing insights in the core trust seal process and how others did this. A, uh, a, a model for uh, uh, preventing the costs of digital preservation, a preferred formats tool, which is a guidance for development of pre uh, preferred formats, and a virtual research environment to test uh, pre-ingest tooling in an environment um, without having to install all these uh, tools uh, uh, before. So instruments as these are important in collaboration. They are developed as a co-creation between various Dutch organizations and experts. And they are the drivers for further collaboration as most of these tools hold best practices information and there is a community of practice around the use of these instruments. To conclude with some lessons learned from the previous 20 years of collaboration. Collaboration is uh, primarily about experts, about people, working together. The element of trust in, is in, in this is very important. Furthermore, it is important to have a driving force in collaboration, preferably a network of organizations not attached directly to the specific institute, independent from institutional policies and interests. Sharing knowledge is an important step. If you are able to accompany this with development of supporting instruments, that's even better and set up communities around these supporting instruments in order to promote and stimulate the actual usage of these instruments is very important. And perhaps maybe the most important lesson, collaboration is also fun. Learning from each other, uh, talking with others and sharing experience is absolutely necessary, but also the, the most rewarding part of my job. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Marcel. Listen, I, I should have said out loud as well uh, to everyone, there'll be a chance for some question and answer right at the end of our uh, introductory presentations uh, just now. 
So what we'll do, if that's okay, was we'll keep we'll keep moving uh, and we'll keep the conversation lively. It's a very great pleasure at this point, therefore, to introduce uh, Courtney Muma. Uh, now, I think we should welcome Courtney, not just because of the many wise things she'll share with us about collaboration at the National Digital Stewardship Alliance in the US and also the Texas Digital Library, but also because it's early in the morning. Uh, and I'm very grateful to you, Courtney, for the, the early start. So let me hand over to you, Courtney, and uh, follow on from uh, Marcel's wonderful words. Hopefully you can see my screen. <clears throat> yes, we can. That's wonderful. All righty. Um, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I'm really pleased to be here with you this morning, um, though, yes, it is very early. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, on behalf of all of the Texas Digital Library staff members pictured here, um, hello to everyone in the international community. These eight people serve Texas Digital Library's 26 members as systems administrators, software developers, communication staff, executives, and service managers, and I am the Deputy Director of the Texas Digital Library Consortium. TDL is a collaborative consortium based in Texas and rooted in higher education, whose mission is to build capacity among its membership for ensuring equitable access to and preservation of digital content of value to research, instruction, cultural heritage, and institutional memory. We are an affordable source of essential infrastructure through the development and maintenance of shared systems staff and resources. This slide lists our seven service offerings. Again, we have eight staff. <laughs> and the open source software or community-based solution that we use for each service. We are passionate advocates for openness, open content where possible, open infrastructure and standards, open source platforms, and transparent decision making. TDL connects a statewide network of professionals working in academic libraries and archives of all sizes, as well as our first public library member, the Houston Public Library, and we've just had Tarrant County Community College join us as well. We seek to propel the academic and research enterprise <clears throat> forward by protecting the digital scholarly and cultural record and by radically broadening access to it. This means everything from training opportunities and list serves, committees and working groups, networking and professional development opportunities, opportunities, and representation on local, regional, national, and international governing groups. One of those groups where I participate as an elected coordinating committee member representing the Texas Digital Library Consortium is the NDSA, which is hosted by CLEAR and the Digital Library Federation. The NDSA is a consortium of nearly 300 partnering organizations, including universities, professional associations, businesses, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations, all of whom are committed to the long-term preservation of digital information. Representatives from within TDL member institutions also contribute to NDSA interest in working groups. And I also contributed to the NDSA Levels of Preservation 2.0 on their behalf. Um, some of you may be familiar with that. And that's everything I have in terms of introduction, um, but I'm again, very happy to be here today. Thank you so much, uh, Courtney. And that's an important message. There are collaborations happening there. There are different levels. There's a very core technology collaboration at the Texas Digital Library and a much larger open national level, international indeed, collaboration happening to NDSA. And that's both insights are important, I think, to our conversation uh, today. So thank you for that. Listen, we should, we should move on though. It's a great pleasure to introduce colleagues now from Latin America, uh, from an agency called RIPDAZA. I shall let uh, our speakers introduce that. Uh, however, a great uh, honor to introduce Monica uh, Morona, uh, who I'm gonna get this the wrong way around, who is from uh, joining us today from uh, Uruguay. 
uh, and uh, also, uh, let me see, I've got my notes uh, wrong, uh, uh, Mireza, yeah. Mireza uh, yes. Gonzalez, I'm going to, apologies, I've got your terrible pronunciation, uh, from uh, Vertical uh, to speak to us, and also to uh, warmly welcome uh, with them also Pamela <coughs> Wiesner uh, Oyarsi and Perla Olivia Rodriguez who will join in the discussion later uh, as well I understand so a warm welcome to you all and please do uh, take over let us know about your collaboration. Gracias. Bienvenidos. Monica y, y yo vamos a estar presentando información sobre eh, RIDAPSA Yo voy a compartir eh, primero información general sobre la organización y luego Mónica va a hablar un poco sobre los proyectos con los que hemos estado trabajando. Eh, voy a compartir un momento mi pantalla eh, para que eh, tengan acceso a lo que nosotros le llamamos el dossier de trabajos de RIDAPSA. Eh, como eh, muy bien eh, nos comparten, eh, mi nombre es Mirza González, yo soy investigadora eh, relacionada con la Red Iberoamericana de Preservación Digital de Archivos Sonoros y Audiovisuales, eh, que fue creada en el 2019 para compartir saberes y experiencias de investigadores de universidades e eh, instituciones de la memoria, empresas y organismos institucionales de la región eh, a fin de favorecer la investigación científica en torno a la situación y a las perspectivas de futuro de la herencia sonora y audiovisual de nuestra región. Y con ello proponer alternativas ante su riesgo de pérdida, particularmente aquellas orientadas a la digitalización de los acervos en peligro de pérdida. La RIDAPSA es auspiciada por el Programa Iberoamericano de Ciencias y Tecnología para el Desarrollo, conocido también como CITEC. Nosotros hemos desarrollado un dossier que presenta información general de nuestra eh, red, en donde participan eh, sobre 15 investigadores de países latinoamericanos y eh, de España. Eh, entre los eh, investigadores que participan con, con nosotros, pues está la doctora Perla Olivia Rodríguez Sendis de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, quien es, eh, digamos que, la coordinadora principal, la directora de todos los esfuerzos de RIDAPSA, y eh, estoy compartiendo con ustedes, ¿verdad?, algunos de esos este, otros investigadores que eh, algunos de ellos están presentes con nosotros hoy, ¿verdad?, eh, y, y eh, un poco compartir con ustedes los trabajos que hemos estado haciendo. La RIDAPSA reconoce que las instituciones de la memoria sonora y audiovisual representan en estos momentos un gran desafío porque experimentan una reducción significativa de recursos humanos diestro para el manejo efectivo de las colecciones. A pesar de de que se experimenta una mayor, mayor valorización de nuestros acervos y con ello, ¿verdad?, un interés de nuestras comunidades en aportar a su preservación desde la experiencia del voluntariado. Lo cierto es que se necesita conocimiento y dominio de las nuevas tecnologías, así como el manejo de prácticas archivísticas efectivas a modo de garantizar la preservación de la mayor cantidad de contenido en resguardo. De los esfuerzos desarrollados por RIDAPSA, deseamos resaltar dos iniciativas encaminadas a fortalecer el desarrollo profesional en la región. La primera de ellas es una serie de webinarios gratuitos iniciados en el 2020 que logró integrar a sobre 1.300 participantes de 23 países de la región y sobre 500 organizaciones diferentes. Este proyecto de webinarios logró ser finalista 
en el Digital Preservation Awards del 2020 y la doctora Mónica Marona, a quien voy a pasarle ahora nuestra presentación, va a hablar un poco más sobre los webinarios y sobre, el segundo, eh, sobre la segunda estrategia con la que hemos estado trabajando, que tiene que ver con publicaciones académicas. Bueno, muchas gracias. Buenos días y buenas tardes a, a todos y todas. Eh, yo voy a solicitar, si es posible, me habiliten para compartir pantalla. Perfecto. Bien, eh, yo quería compartir con ustedes eh, lo que ha sido el trabajo este, que hemos hecho en, en RIPTASA, en la Red Iberoamericana de Preservación Digital de Archivos Sonoros y Audiovisuales, eh, que ya este, la colega Mirersa acaba de este, explicar eh, las, las razones eh, y su este, organización general. Eh, yo quería referirme a dos productos concretos eh, que, que, que son los primeros resultados de, esta, eh, de este trabajo eh, que, se ha, que se ha realizado eh, por esta red. Eh, el año pasado se publicaron estos dos este, informes, Estado de la Preservación Digital en los Archivos Sonoros y Audiovisuales de Iberoamérica, coordinado por la doctora Perla Olivia Rodríguez, este, que es la coordinadora eh, de esta red, y eh, Preservación Digital en los Archivos Sonoros y Audiovisuales de Iberoamérica. Eh, los retos y alternativas para el siglo XXI, eh, coordinado también por Perla Olivia Rodríguez y por eh, el doctor Mateo Manfredi, este, que es este, también colega e integrante de la, de la red. Eh, estos libros lo que recogen son los informes eh, que se hicieron a partir de eh, los trabajos de eh, diagnósticos de la, de la situación en los, en los distintos este, acervos eh, de, de sonoros y audiovisuales de Iberoamérica y eh, un análisis este, más, más pormenorizado. Yo quisiera eh, este, presentar aquí los, los que han trabajado como cabeza de los equipos en cada uno de los países y que han este, colaborado desde la red y en concreto desde estas publicaciones para la confección de, este, de un informe de la situación actual de, de, de los archivos sonoros y audiovisuales con la perspectiva de pensar cuáles podrían ser este, las recomendaciones y eh, las alternativas para este, mejorar nuestras, nuestras capacidades. Este, en ese sentido, eh, en, este, en este informe, eh, se analizan los datos que se tomaron de una encuesta eh, que se realizó a más de 360 instituciones públicas y privadas, este, una consulta este, que este, ahí se detallan, eh, que tenía como objetivo bueno, analizar eh, la situación actual. Eh, ¿en, qué, ¿En qué condiciones están este, los archivos? ¿Cuáles son sus principales este, desafíos? ¿En qué formatos están, este, están, están recogida la, la, la información? ¿Cómo se, se resguarda? ¿Cómo se presenta? ¿Y cómo se capacitan este, las, las distintas instituciones para este, cumplir eh, ese cometido de eh, salvaguardar el legado de estos, de estos archivos. Eh, aquí, este, bueno, el índice, este, este material está todo online y está disponible. Este, en, ahora les vamos a, a dejar los, los, los links para que ustedes los puedan este, consultar y ver detalladamente. Este segundo libro eh, lo que recoge son análisis de cada uno de los países acerca de, eh, bueno, los retos y las alternativas. Ahí lo que encontramos son los puntos comunes en cada uno de los, de los países 
participantes, las percepciones de riesgo y qué es lo que eh, se está haciendo este, en cada uno de los, de los distintos eh, países y a nivel de las distintas instituciones públicas y privadas que, que intervienen este, en este proceso y en estos desafíos. Eh, aquí lo que, lo que uno puede ver analizando este trabajo son esos puntos en común, esas este, situaciones que tienen que ver con los riesgos y eh, las eh, eh, dificultades de, de eh, lograr hacer, eh, generar acciones eh, para, que esto, eh, para que este patrimonio sonoro y audiovisual eh, no se siga perdiendo. La percepción de riesgo atraviesa a, 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 todos las, a todas las instituciones y la búsqueda de alternativas. Y el segundo punto importante es este, que en todos los eh, encuentros hay una necesidad de eh, visualizar la colaboración y la cooperación entre las instituciones. Algo que este, en, estos, en, en las exposiciones previas estuvo también como uno de los, de los puntos este, centrales. Esto es un trabajo que no se puede hacer eh, solitariamente, sino en conjunto. Y por último, referirme a una experiencia que fue extremadamente importante por parte de la red y que justamente apuntaba a esa capacitación y a esa colaboración. Eh, estamos en la tercera edición de los webinars eh, se comenzaron en el 2019, se hizo la edición 2020 y este, este año se ha iniciado la tercera edición. Eh, lo interesante ha sido el éxito y el creciente aumento. Eh, empezamos con un número de casi 700 este, participantes, lo cual era una cifra importante, pero eh, prácticamente se duplicó al año siguiente y además aumentaron la cantidad de países eh, que han participado eh, tanto como expositores como este, integrantes de esta experiencia, que son este, bueno, países que ahí estamos, estamos definiendo este, y que va cada vez más en aumento, además de la preservación de las de la participación perdón, de más de 500 instituciones públicas y privadas este, de estos países. Eh, una experiencia que hemos, este, que hemos recibido este, importantes este, eh, bueno, reconocimientos y devoluciones de su, eh, de su importancia y de los aportes allí realizados. Toda esta información está, eh, la pueden disponer online, eh, la tenemos eh, por un lado eh, lo que es el programa de, de RIPDASA y toda la, la información, eh, los webinars están disponibles en, en YouTube y los libros también están este, disponibles en este sitio del, eh, del CITED este, y que tiene el espacio para... Eh, para, el, para las publicaciones de, eh, de RIP DASA que ya mencionamos. Bueno, muchas gracias. Bien. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, uh, Monica uh, and Mire, uh, Miretza, uh, very much. Uh, thank you very much for your, your presentation there. I should have said by way of introduction, uh, an English translation will be available. I should have said that by way of introduction. So thank you uh, for, those, um, for those looking. Uh, for that. And we, of course, we can do multilingual translation when we come to the panel session that will follow uh, at, the, uh, at the end. Uh, so thank you very much. Listen, we should, we should uh, move on. Uh, time is pressing. It's a, a very great uh, pleasure, therefore, uh, next on uh, our list of speakers, a great pleasure to introduce Thibault. Uh, Thibault Huzanmi is, uh, is with the uh, African Development Bank uh, group. Uh, and is also uh, highly involved in the ICA, the International Council on Archives uh, program uh, for uh, managing digital and physical uh, records. All of that I shall let Thibault introduce much more effectively and fluently than I ever could. Thibault. Thank you, William. If you can hear me, I'll get started. Thank you for this opportunity to, to talk about digital preservation to this varied uh, audience. Uh, William and others have made wonderful introductions to digital preservation and what it means. 
So I wish not to repeat those. I will just blaze through some aspects really quickly as they matter in the final point we're trying to make. So without further ado, what I wish I knew about digital preservation, uh, particular collaboration really means to me, uh, what have you done in practical terms and how can I learn from it? If that's what you had in mind in joining this webinar, um, I wish to tell you that this is exactly what I'm going to talk about. What digital preservation is, really is keeping the digital piece alive in a way that the software that writes it or that wrote it on the medium can read it. And in a way that if we need to transform that text into audio, or any other usability aspect that we can do so. So access and usability and persistence of the record is critical for digital preservation. The problems, as uh, William already uh, highlighted, are related to media obsolescence, content obsolescence. Sometimes you cannot separate the content from the media because they are one in the same, sometimes you can. And so that risk is very high with physical media, even though they store digital records. Now, in the current environment where we work, where we, our systems are hosted in the cloud, we don't even have access to that media. We don't have access to that server. We don't have access to storage at all. So the problem is far away, yet it exists. How do we address it? in an environment. First thing you need to know is the remedy and risk mitigation techniques related to digital objects are fairly well documented and that's right at the center of the screen. However, to achieve that towards the, to persist the record itself, you need to defer to expertise in each one of those eight areas, redundancy, migration, emulation, refreshing diversity, inertia, metadata, and auditing. Just like we are able to read papyrus or see images of them, a scribe had to write it, an anthropologist had to interpret it, a restoration expert has to do its job. So we need to defer to expertise. That's a lesson of humility. At the African Development Bank, the way in which we address this issue is that we need not separate it from the current way people are working. The African Development Bank is an organization that is tasked with implementing large development projects. And as such, it has board and governance and the way in which it makes decisions are very important and generate vital records, and the way in which it implements projects through all the project cycle you can see on the left are also highly critical. So the way in which we approach this is to work together with the IT department, work with the record producing units, and define a solution that's called Sankofa that's being used. What is key here is collaboration. This is a poor initiative by the Secretary General uh, Office because of his mandate. And even as a eminent professor of law, he deferred to expertise and higher expertise to get this going. To the point where we now we have a solution developed where the bank can work and records are preserved immediately as we work. And digital preservation is an extension that will enable vital and records of lasting value to be preserved continually. That, in a nutshell, is what I would like to share with you today. Three lessons. Number one, recognize relative limitation of one expert department of organization. Number two, defer or to or higher expertise to get the needed work done. Number three, by all means, lead the effort and bring it all together by keeping everyone focused. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for that uh, message, Thibault, and bringing everything together uh, is indeed, I guess, the real key to a lot of our collaboration uh, efforts. So thank you 
after that. Listen, we have one, uh, we have one, uh, an opportunity for questions to, to follow, but we have one final presentation from the, the set of panelists uh, today. Uh, and it's a very great pleasure, uh, therefore, to introduce uh, Alina Carlos. Uh, Alina is uh, with the University uh, of Namibia uh, with particular interests around electronic document uh, and records management systems and of course the, the preservation uh, of EDR uh, MS. And uh, Alina also I know has been very involved in some elements of ICA's uh, own uh, programme so I'll hand over to Alina uh, to describe her work and her collaboration. Yes, uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'm Alina, as mentioned by William. I'm with the University of Namibia, assistant archivist in the department, as well as a part-time tutor at, in the, at the academic department. So uh, my contribution to this webinar is on teaching digitization and digital preservation for archival educators. I am going to focus more on the challenges and the recommendations uh, for educa uh, archival educators when it comes to digital preservation. As mentioned by William, it's a um, challenging um, uh, field and it is challenging both for educators as it is in the industry. So um, what, from my observation, it is mostly poor curriculums in the universities with the uh, um, contents commonly built around preservation actions, less emphasis placed on topics such as policies and ethics, as well as standards that are lacking in most countries um, um, and it, that need to be strengthened in preservation education. So digital preservation education lacks topics on diversity and inclusion, which is a foundation of the profession really if you look at archival institutions and libraries across the globe. Um, uh, there's also lack of ITC infrastructure for practical teaching in universities, which forces educators to teach on theory basis and less technology and class uh, uh, incorporated in class teaching. And uh, the industry expects uh, graduates to have knowledge practically as you are required to go and carry out projects that are being um, carried out in the field. Uh, limited stu uh, student attachments periods also that uh, uh, does not give students opportunities to explore in the field much. Uh, this goes well with the lack of ICT, uh, IT infrastructure for that um, to happen effectively. Uh, wrong placements for student interns, which means attach at, sometimes in at, at, at attachments. Organizations don't really have digitization projects running, which does not give students uh, um, exposure to this practically. Um, so I have a few recommendations. Review to review curriculum, uh, uh, curriculums in consultation with stakeholders. Stakeholders can be the professionals in the industry to just strengthen uh, what should, what they expect uh, the, 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 the outcome of graduates from the high learning institutions. Um, so also integrate digital preservation tools and technologies into course content through class activities, as I've mentioned. This also means now to invest in proper infrastructure for practical teaching. Uh, my suggestion is that as digitization can be costly, this can be done by uh, coming together with uh, governments and private institutions to have uh, this incorporated into uh, uh, digital preservation education. Um, also to raise awareness to professionals regarding the importance of job attachments to make sure that uh, students are placed in the right um, uh, given exposure to the right fields and practicals for a good uh, outcome from uh, the programs. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, digitization is, the digital preservation is, will be much improved 
from the education uh, prospect for it to be carried out effectively in the industry. This is by universities producing well-refined products uh, into the industry. Uh, that is my contribution. I uh, thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much for your presentation, uh, Alina. Now, listen, we've got uh, a, a brief, uh, we're going to turn over to a panel session uh, uh, now. I wonder if we'll just give ourselves, however, just a very brief uh, interval, uh, just time to go grab a, a glass of water or to pile up any questions you might have. And maybe we could just agree to be back uh, by my clock. It's uh, 11 minutes past the hour. Maybe we could agree to be back at 13 minutes past the hour. And that will give us just long enough for a good 15 minutes or more uh, of conversation and Q&A uh, with the panels. So is everyone uh, happy to take a short, a very short break? I'm going to take silence as consent on the matter. So we'll leave this open. It's better, by the way, if you simply mute and mic your microphone and video, uh, as it were, rather than leave, because then you'll be able to maintain the chat function. But we'll give ourselves a two minute break. Thank you very much. Maybe we could end this brief session by giving our, all of our speakers a quick round of applause uh, in the usual fashion, or indeed put your camera on and give them a, a round of applause in person. Uh, and then we'll be back again in two minutes time, uh, just for a very short break. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, that will show me you're there. Great to see you again. 
and we've got uh, thank you Lydia uh, we've got, we've a, got few, a few minutes yes. a few minutes okay. I'm getting an echo there uh, we're getting we've got uh, some time for some panel discussion now so uh, let's uh, get ourselves uh, underway uh, with panel discussion maybe I could ask the panelists maybe just keep your keep your cameras on uh, and we can uh, hear from you uh, as we as we go. So at this point, uh, I have to just dig out. We've obviously had some questions prepared in advance, and those questions uh, you've all submitted to us by way of uh, by way of introduction. Uh, so I wonder if we could. Uh, I'm just sorry. Let me just. I should have organised this better. Just pull up the questions. Uh, that we have pre-prepared because the good news is that some of you had very similar questions and so we were able to put some of, although there were very many uh, questions, we were able to put a few of them together and to give a sense of the what we felt were the priority topics. Uh, so let me just pull that together and get ourselves uh, underway. So uh, our first question, uh, which came from uh, a question from uh, Joel Cooper with the Department of Social Services uh, in Australia. Uh, Joel asked, uh, how do you convince executives to buy in to digital preservation when return on investment is so far in the future. Uh, that's, a, 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 I think, a, a relevant and interesting question for us all. Uh, and indeed, it is a question which is very similar to a question Nicholas Zimmer uh, from University of Cape Town, uh, and also Anastasia uh, Impinje from Namibia. They both had a very similar question. How do we get uh, investment uh, from senior executives. I'm going to pause and see who would like which of the panel uh, feels they'd like to take uh, that question. Maybe I can start, uh, William. Thank you, Marcel. Um, Appreciate um, that. <laughs> I think well, a very a very short and, and, and answer would be perhaps we need a good crisis sometimes. Um, in your presentation, you already showed uh, 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 an example of data loss, uh, and and I guess we should we uh, we should tell managers what happens uh, when data gets lost in in terms of. Uh, uh revenues in terms of uh what does it cost to digitize a collection again uh, for instance um because that's probably uh part of 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 the language uh managers speak um what i uh, what i saw within the Dutch digital heritage network it's also on the part of the funders as uh, uh Funding for uh, the Dutch Digital Heritage Network, it's much focused on the feasibility of digital collections. And a very um, um, regarding the use of linked open data, um, try to um, link uh, digital collections as many as possible and try to make collections visible as many as possible. So then I always had to shout, okay, link data is, is fine, link data is nice, but what about uh, having these collections available in uh, two years from now or five years from now? Then you, you have uh, warehouses full of, of link data triples, but um, where is the data? Uh, so in my respect, sometimes we, we just need to explain what happens when, when data gets lost and give them examples of data getting lost. Thank you very much. It's interesting when I put that slide together, it was a couple of months ago, it was March, but actually just yesterday, I gather there was a big meltdown in one of the service providers that didn't delete any content, but did result in huge parts of the internet suddenly being, being unavailable for 40 minutes. 
40 minutes. It feels like an eternity online waiting for a website to download for 40 minutes. And that's the fragility really does concentrate mm -hmm. the minds, doesn't it? Uh, on that. I wonder if any of our other panelists would be interested in, in thinking uh, on that question also. How do you convince executives to buy in to digital transformation? William, I would like to try. Yeah, uh, I think I subscribe to the views that are just expressed by my colleague. And I think um, also a uh, good crisis absolutely uh, helps. Um, Sometimes legislation helps because if, uh, uh, like in the US, if there's a law or there's a, a presidential memorandum that makes a decision that every uh, the department of the federal government must have digital preservation or digital records managed by a certain timeline, it really gets the ball rolling as well. Um, but the short answer here, I, I would say, is that one needs to hire experts, uh, one of, uh, of wisdom, uh, one experts that have practical uh, implementation experiences. Uh, no theory is good, uh, but the theory is as good as the implementation it, itself. Uh, this is really an excellent question that speaks to uh, intangible sales. So, um, if you show up in front of the senior executive and wanted to sell an idea, we need to do digital preservation, but you need to have your numbers and you need to have maybe uh, something to show for. So instead of just talking about it, making it tangible, you want to make it tangible. And to make it tangible, you need a sponsor within your organization. Uh, some senior executive may be more sensitive to it, uh, could be your, your guide. And you need to work on defining your requirements in a way that supports your organization's business. Digital preservation cannot be an ex nihilo uh, enterprise where you do it separately, or it's at the end of the life cycle of the records. It needs to be embedded in the work process day by day. So records are captured from draft all the way up to the finalized version and disclosure rules are applied, record keeping rules are applied. If you do it that way, you are able to capture most of the metadata before the record that reach the end of the life cycle. Now, as you develop a, a test, then you also need to have other colleagues involved and have those assumptions all worked out. So you, you get the benefit from perspective. That's also collaboration. At the African Development Bank, that's um, what we did. And uh, Professor Vance Mahile has been instrumental in uh, leading these efforts uh, leadership. And so far we have a solution developed, it's called Sankofa. It bridges digital work environment, you know, uh, Microsoft SharePoint, which is connected to IBM's FileNet. So as you start collaborating on any project, then your colleagues can have access if they have the right to, and the records when it's approved or finalized, that store in FileNet where there's robust protect, uh, protection in there. This is all done within the IT environment and access is made a lot easier. So this is the short answer I can, I can give you so far. I hope I'll let other colleagues also chime in. Thank you. I wonder if any other colleagues do want to come in on that. How do we get executive buy-in? Or indeed, if you want us to move on to another question, would anyone want to pick that up? Oh yes, I, I would like to, to share my point of view. <laughs> thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to tell thank you, thank you to DPC and Ika for this webinar. And about the first questions, I would like to tell that for from my point of view and my experience in Mexico and in Latin America, the main um, idea to convince to the directors to protect the uh, uh, information and the sound and audiovisual patrimony is to to tell them that it's a cultural heritage and a form of patrimony and um, the, um, I, I think that the digital preservation is a uh, misunderstanding because um, unfortunately we think that, that the, uh, if we obtain money for uh, to start to the digital preservation is enough but um, 
I think that it's important first to understand that digital preservation is a process, a continuous process. And if we don't make this, we uh, can lose the, uh, the um, heritage, this kind of heritage. This, this is from my point of view, the most difficult idea to, uh, to, to understand. Thank you so much, uh, Perla and Thibault uh, and Marcel for uh, your contributions uh, there. I wonder if it, we've got a lot of questions, so perhaps I could uh, pitch uh, another question. And uh, I wonder, uh, maybe this is one I could try for Courtney in particular, I, although you're all free to participate, of course. Courtney, you have a, a very big, or what looks to me like a big team, it's really not, I know you're very, thinly stretched with all of the tasks as well. But I wonder, a question that we came in from Jill Fewings uh, ahead of our uh, seminar, how do you get cross-departmental teams together within uh, an institution? How do you pull together a team with all the different skills that you've shown your little team uh, has and all the many tasks they have to do? Okay, I'll take that. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm coming from the perspective, of course, uh, as a consortium. And so I offer support to our member institutions in Texas and beyond um, when they need basically consultation around digital preservation issues and then also infrastructure. And recently we've had a new member join. And when I sat at the table with all of the interested parties in that institution, um, none of them had ever come together before to talk about their interest in digital preservation. And I said, hey, y'all should probably be some kind of group that meets regularly. <laughs> And that actually has made a huge difference in the last year for them. In fact, such a huge difference that the staff member who took up the lead doing that won an award um, for her collaborative efforts. Um, it's also enabled them to change their digital preservation approach and have an approach that comes directly from each sector in the organization that has a need. So their digitization folks, their uh, IT staff, their art gallery, um, their archives, special collections, they all came together, respected each other's expertise, and relied on those experts in order to understand the workflows that they needed to put in place and the kinds of partnerships that they needed to make externally, like Texas Digital Library, like a system um, that they pay service for. Um, in their case, it's Archivematica, but it could be any other system. Um, so it helped them understand all of the pieces that were involved. Um, and I think that this has to happen at any individual organization. I do want to throw back quickly, if it's all right, to the last question, and I won't give my full answer for that question, but I do believe inherently that hoisting the responsibility for convincing executives at individual institutions on the backs of the laboring uh, staff who handle the records is not ideal. Uh, I think it's people like myself um, and other large coordinators of activity to advocate better and to help can and help make that argument. Um, and I believe that to my core, <laughs> uh, which is why all along the way, even when that group started convening, I uh, have been with them and arguing for them on the national scale. That's a, a, a wonderful message. Courtney, I wonder if I can uh, agree wholeheartedly with what you said. I think I, DPC has a role, ICA has a role to 
use uh, an idiom to make the weather here so that those executives are already listening to this message around preservation. So when the, the labourers <laughs> come in from the fields, they have a sense of the importance already and are inclined to listen, because otherwise it's a double job, isn't it? Uh, you're asking people to do two things. Uh, I uh, also, to note, bringing together, I had an experience of working in an institution. We had a, a, we set up a working party. We had 16 departments show up. That doesn't mean to say we had 16 great people doing digital preservation. It meant we had 16 people pointing, if you could, with 15 fingers to everyone else hoping someone else would pick it up and bringing them together is the, the way forward. Uh, wonderful. And I wonder if I can invite others on the panel to reflect on that question. How do you bring cross-institutional partnerships together? If you allow me to share our experience of course. Um, with the DAPSA, uh, one of the main things that we have been able to achieve uh, by means of collaboration and networking is basically to explore uh, practices that seems to be effective, that has, you know, in a way they have been able to provide for different stakeholders within institutions and also the communities that we serve, because, you know, even though we are researchers or scholars that are based in academic institutions, the truth is that many of the objects and the artifacts and the documents that we try to preserve digitally um, are, you know, part of a bigger kind of cultural heritage uh, um, uh, collections, you know, and that that are not that are that we don't that we are not the owners of those. Yes. So one of the things that we have been able to do and to explore by um, by our interactions with Idapsa is how different uh, organizations have been able to achieve better practices when collaborating with communities. I think there is something beautiful about bringing community members to work as you know as partners in our projects and i think that's the way we can convene uh, other scholars and other practitioners within our institutions to come together join us in the in that effort see because there's something very interesting that marcel was was able to share nicely when he was doing his presentation and that is the element of trust yes and so when you bring other stakeholders to the picture people who really are interested in keeping you know their heritage the the, the elements the artifacts those things that are so important for them you know in terms of community uh, membership i think that's that's one of the key to um, to facilitate uh, collaboration and, and, and networking. And, and that's something that we have been able to explore uh, through RIDAPSA, and that's something that is very much at the heart of what Latin American organizations and institutions are trying to achieve. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Listen, we, we're, we're pressed for time. I, 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 I'm keen to get through as many questions as we can. And so uh, that probably means I've got time for one more, if you will permit me to run a little beyond the, the schedule time. So I'll, I'll maybe find uh, one more question to share with you all. And, I, and I'm interested in a question from uh, Stephen, uh, from Stephen Howard, actually, in the Netherlands, who uh, asked advice. What uh, advice would you give to an organization drafting requirements for a digital drafting requirements for a digital preservation solution prior to launching even uh, a tender? So what advice would you potentially give to uh, someone uh, who's trying to gather requirements for a digital preservation uh, solution? I wonder if I can 
nudge anyone. Um, Pamela, if I may, I'm thinking that speaks a little to your experience with ABP as a, an advisor and consultant to very many institutions. Uh, would you have a, a reflection on that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so taking off my lift as a hat for a second, putting on my ABP hat. Um, yeah, we've worked with a lot of organizations going through the process of creating um, RFPs or specific requirements or requirements for digital preservation. Um, and um, I think that's that's the key is, you know, just sitting down and defining those requirements because although, um, you know, the, the basis for digital preservation could be very similar and maybe uh, some of the functionalities for systems uh, are very similar, there could be some small things that, uh, you know, could be deal breakers for, for your organization. And I also think that is a, um, a very good opportunity. And this is also tied to what we were uh, just talking about, um, you know, like collaboration and bringing all the different stakeholders um, to have this conversation. I think this is also a very good opportunity to bring up those questions um, and, and learn from each other. We found through this process in many organizations um, that this is sometimes the first time that they come together to talk about these things. And maybe some organizations have been doing uh, little pieces of digital preservation uh, sort of on their own. Um, so we think this is, you know, just going through the process of gathering requirements is a good opportunity to bringing um, everyone together. Um, and um, also ensuring some buy-in um, after um, acquiring the system or, through the implementation as well, because um, they've been part of the process too. And so just, you know, making sure that all the voices are included um, also helps um, the process. That's very thoughtful. Thank you, uh, Pamela. Perhaps I could see if anyone else wants to have a, a reflection on that uh, same question. What advice, prior, you know, to gather requirements? Oh. Courtney, I see your microphone going on. <laughs> so, I'll be I'll be quick. I'll just add um, to Pamela's excellent answer uh, that um, I think it is important to think of this as a partnership that you're seeking and not as uh, seeking a solution. Um, I think it's often un misunderstood um, this idea that there is a solution that you can purchase and then you're good. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think it's a really good opportunity in gathering requirements to figure out what partners work can you work with in order to accomplish those things that you've laid out as you've thought through your requirements. That's a very thoughtful observation. One of my colleagues, Paul Wheatley, is fond of telling me that when we go to procurement of preservation systems, our first requirement will be how to get out of that system in order that the system does not become a digital preservation risk in, in its own right. Uh, and of course, we can learn from each other uh, in, in along the, the road there. So, so listen, we're, we're, we're well past uh, our scheduled stop time. I wonder though if I may indulge you one more time, maybe invite panelists or indeed Anthea or other colleagues to give any final thoughts, uh, observations or reflections before we bring things to a close. I think the, to thank everybody firstly for joining us today and for being part of the panel as well as for being participants. Um, I think just picking up on a point that you made William and to really reinforce to those people that are on this call, perfection is not possible. It will never be possible uh, because the technologies that we're dealing with are perpetually changing. And so our, our processes need to evolve and they'll never be 100% perfect. I think the one thing I learned when I was working in the area of digital preservation was if you need to test something, start small. You'll learn everything you need to know, I think with some of the smaller projects rather than trying to bite off a huge chunk uh, and then get really overwhelmed and, and feel like you can't do it. So that would be my advice as someone who previously from the field. Um, and uh, I think that I, again, would like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank DPC for, for co-hosting with us. I'd like to thank all of our panelists. And I wish everybody a really, really happy International Archives Day. 
uh, and I hope that you'll continue to join us and the DPC and our, our partners here for the rest of the week. Uh, and, and also, inter don't forget International Digital Preservation Day in November. In, I think it's the 9th, isn't it, Sarah? We're on the 9th of November now? Uh, 4th of November. The 4th of November. Okay, <laughs> so mark your calendars. Make sure you get it in there. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all again. I don't know, William, if you want to say some few final words. Well, the, yeah, I just want to thank you, Anthea, and your team uh, at the International Council on Archives, your very generous support to this event today, your initiative and in thinking behind uh, International Archives Week, and you're welcome to us to, to gate crash your own party. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, those who have spoken, to, uh, to our, uh, our panellists who have shared wisely their expertise. What I maybe would simply ask you all, if I may, is not to view this as a, an event, view this as the start of a process. Our workshop is about collaboration. You've now met people, you've met colleagues and friends, and maybe the very final thing to do then, if you're all still there, is I could get you please to put your cameras on. <laughs> I ask you please, just for a moment, just for a moment, to put your cameras on. You know, some of you know, some of you know what's coming here because you've been to DPC events before. And I want to just get a bit of human contact right at the end because collaboration is a human project, you know. So if you're kind to put your camera on, I'm going to ask John if he's agreeable. Uh, he normally does the magic for us. We'll get a good screen grab of everyone sitting together, working together, collaborating. Yeah, collaborating. Being available, Being to, available each other, to each other, which I think is a key message for us. John, do you want to count us down? If you ever need to just smile and wave, that would be great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Super, so that's a friendly message to leave on, isn't it? Thank you all very much. Let's leave it there and we'll see you uh, on World Digital Preservation Day, which is the fourth. <laughs> 4th of November to, uh, 2021. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day, Thank everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.